welcome to a new video from Joggler 66 Hour of the Truth. Today is here at my time already, 7 o'clock in the evening, the sun setting down, the 19th of April 2017. And I've come to the mic to meet two of my very much valued brothers in Christ in the United States over of America who will join me today in reading and discussing the book The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. The one, of course, you know because he has been here all the last six times and doing the reading and discussion very much with me together, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, who I will introduce in a few moments. But today we also have the honor to welcome our brother in Christ, Brett Norman who is absolutely a lot of working in the Antichrist system for the moment, because we all have to pay our bills. But today, wonderful uh, working of the Spirit, he has the time to join us in our broadcast and our reading and discussion of the book, The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. So, welcome to the microphone, Brett. How are you doing? Great. Thank you, Yerk. And I'm pleased to be here, pleased to be with Tom. And, uh, you know, uh, your listeners may not know that I'm a carpenter and I work uh, in the profession of doing uh, finished carpentry and, uh, and commercial carpentry when, when I needed or when, when my uh, skills are needed. And, uh, yeah, I mean... Um, of course, it's uh, you know it's a lot to take on when you own a house and you got all these bills to pay. So, yeah. it's been kind of nuts over the past month here. Yeah, you know it's but, quite uh, important for, to me um, that you at least join us in this one broadcast. I hope many more will come where you can join us because it is uh, thanks to you that I have this book anyway because you sent me that. Oh yes, wonderful. I'm along along with a few that. along with a few other books. Um, Absolutely pleased to send you those books because yeah. I know that that uh, from the work we've done on on the uh, on the Skype here and and working on photos for videos and having discussions that uh, this spirit definitely was leading me to do that and that's my pleasure to share. So I'm gl glad that you received them with joy and and I'm looking forward to hearing Tom too and uh, I'll just. Uh, let you guys back at it. Okay. And Thank welcome you. to the broadcast, Tom, from Inquisition Update. How are you doing today, brother? Yes, I'm doing fine. And nice to be here with you, Yerk, and also Brett. Nice to hear your voice again. And uh, looking for good things out of this book today. And uh, my, uh, my uh, welcome to uh, your listeners. And... Uh, I, I hope they understand the blessing of the Lord that led them to this broadcast, and I hope they glean the best of the information that we have uh, for them. And back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, I know that you often refer to my listeners when we do these recordings, but let me assure you, they are also your listeners, especially <laughs> with the title of the video, Inquisition Updates Meet, Meets Hour of the Truth. And... Um, I very much validate that you are coming to the broadcast and we can do this together. And um, this is where the spirit leads us to page 32 on the book, The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. On the last paragraph, Daniel was told the interpretation in verses 16 through 27 of unfulfilled prophecy as of 70 AD is still the part of the book we are reading in. And I will... Uh, go back to the end of page uh, page 32, which I read last time at the end of the broadcast, to get us in the right mood and start the discussion and, uh, of course, analyzing of what Daniel said here, because the book then continues with that. So, uh, Daniel chapter 7, verses 15 through 27, quote, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by, and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me, and made me know the interpretation of things. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom, and possess the kingdom for ever, even for ever and ever. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were from iron, were of iron, and his nails of brass, 
which devoured, brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes, and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints, and prevailed against them, until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints, that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down, and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. But the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion, and consume to, and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom, and dominion, and the greatness of the kingdom under, under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him." Unquote. Now this is a very important part of Daniel's prophecy, and when we go a little bit into analyzing it, there are a few things that we have spoken already in earlier broadcasts, like we were speaking about the little horn, and the little horn is of course mentioned here, out of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that, that, um, that horn that had eyes, and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints. What horn are we talking about here? The little horn, right, that comes out of the ten. So there we have confirmation that the falling away that came made place for that little horn. Is that right to say it in that way, Tom? Say it again. That that great falling away that came from the church is uh, that little horn that comes actually out of the church. Yes, that's correct. That's that's historically correct and prophetically correct. So that means the, the, the great apostasy, the, the great apostasy out of which this little horn grew is now recognized through history as the Roman Catholic Church. That's the great apostasy. And out of that apostasy, the papacy rose, the man of sin. Exactly. The little horn of Daniel. The point yes, that, he was the he was yeah. the little horn that made war with the saints. Those are the the days of the, the medieval days and the Inquisition and all of that, and uh, he prevailed against them up until the time of the Protestant Reformation, or then nearly so. Mm -hmm. Okay, and yeah, you know, so the, this is describing what 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 the, what runs counter to what is almost universally taught in the churches today. That Bible prophecy, this one in particular, is either fulfilled before 70 A.D. or no later than like 410 A.D. Or, if you don't believe that lie, you can believe the futurist lie uh, that these 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 prophecies won't be fulfilled until just seven years before Christ returns. But a careful and historical reading of Daniel chapter 7, verse 15 through 27, encompasses the entire church age, 2,000 years. This is where the beginning of the, the so-called Holy Roman Empire and how it rose out of the, remember when the restrainer was taken out of the way, that the, the old pagan Roman Caesars, uh, the, the Roman Empire fell into 10 different nations and after the time of the rise of the papacy which replaced the restrainer the pit the caesars uh, there arose three gothic nations that were deemed by the papacy to be heretical 
they didn't uh, agree with the teachings of this great apostate church. And so the papacy led armies to destroy those three nations. This is recorded in history. I believe they were called the Vandals, the Ostrogoths, and the Heruli. They were three. They were three Gothic nations, which the papacy de- uh, described as heathen and heretical heretics. And uh, they, they, and not only they, but all the record of their history was destroyed, utterly destroyed by the the little horn of Daniel, the papacy. And uh, this this has already been fulfilled in history during this quote-unquote church age, immediately after the rise of the Antichrist, who was held under restraint and could not rise to power until the Caesars of the old pagan Roman Empire were taken out of the way. And uh, so this is the perfect recording of at least the first the first centuries of the so-called Christian era. So this is the historicist understanding of Bible prophecy. And, and, and the study of history leaves no room for doubt that this was the prophecy fulfilled by the papacy. And it, it describes this, uh, this, this little horn as a beast and, and uh, the kingdom over which he ruled as a, as a, 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 we, a beast uh, that was unlike any that preceded it. Dreadful and terrible. And so we see that in, the, in its fulfillment in the rise of the great apostasy, Roman Catholicism, which appears to be Christianity, but it's not Christianity at all, and the great idol of Roman Catholicism, the papacy. And... Uh, so we find history perfectly and completely fulfilled uh, uh, of the rise of this little horn that uprooted three other horns beside him whose look was more stout than his fellows <coughs> and uh, thought to change times and laws. Here we have the papacy uh, literally creating the calendar that we use today called the uh, Gregorian calendar, and uh, all time is recognized by it. It's Everyone recognizes, uh, at least in Christendom, quote-unquote Christendom, everyone recognizes the papacy's recognition, rec- uh, reckoning of time through the Gor- Gregorian calendar. And uh, he's also changed God's laws, abolishing the fourth commandment, uh, that being the Sabbath day, and replacing it with Sunday, the first day of the week. And uh, this is how the papacy, and only the papacy, can fulfill this, this prophecy. There's no other candidate that can be recognized from history to have done all these things but the papacy. And I reiterate, I know people get tired of, of hearing me repeat myself, but just as easy as it is for us to recognize who Jesus was, our Messiah, who came at the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel, who was anointed by John in the river, and, and who after three and a half years caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease by giving up his life. The Bible even recordings the th- records the things that he would say verbatim on the, on the cross. And then the final destruction at the end of that three and a half years, uh, or rather the gospel going to the Gentiles and the conversion of, of Cornelius, we have the completion of the 70th week of Daniel. And there's absolutely no way to miss who the Messiah is. He fulfilled all the prophecies. And likewise, his counterpart, his counterfeit, the papacy, has likewise fulfilled the prophecies that Daniel uttered here. And so it's no more difficult to recognize who the Antichrist is than it is from Scripture to understand who the Christ is. And it, it goes back to, to, to my saying, it's, it's, it's an insult to God for any Christian to suggest that after sending his son to die for us and to redeem us from our sins and to gain, gain for us eternal life, in his presence, 
to suffer and bleed and die and to be humiliated and spit upon and whipped with a whip and beaten in the face with fists and to have his beard pulled out and to have a crown stuck, of thorns stuck on his head and be hoisted up on a cross to be crucified by the Roman Empire and to suffer all these things for us and then turn around and leave us for whom he sent his son to die to leave us in doubt of who this deceiver is, to leave us in doubt who the Antichrist is, it's an insult to God. The futurist interpretation of Bible prophecy says the, no, no one can know who the Antichrist is until he signs a peace treaty with the Jews and allows animal sacrifices again. And, and, and all the debate about who is the Antichrist, nobody, if you walk up and down the streets and ask people if they know who the Antichrist is, you'll get a million different answers and every one of them would be wrong. How is it that the God of glory, the merciful God of glory, who sent his own son to redeem us, would leave us equally uncertain about who the Antichrist is who would deceive, if he could, the very elect of God? It's untenable. It's an insult to the throne of glory to insist that we either don't know who the Antichrist is or he hasn't come yet. Absolutely right, Tom. But there was actually another point that I wanted to make that doesn't take anything away of that wonderful explanation that you just gave. It's absolutely correct what you were saying. But I actually wanted to make the bridge to Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, which speaks of the Antichrist. Now we are speaking about preterism and futurism, right? In preterism, many people say that Nero or Caligula was the Antichrist. In futurism, many people say Obama is the Antichrist or another politician. And I remember from the uh, from the 70s, from the early 70s movies that I have been uh, that I have been watching called The Omen, where the Antichrist was to come out of some kind of political or economic power. But when we read Second Thessalonians 2, it is clear that the son of perdition, the man of sin, the Antichrist, comes out of the church itself. That's, that's correct. So everybody who deceives the whole world by saying Obama or another American or whatever color politician or, the, or Islam or whatever is the Antichrist does not speak the truth according to the Bible. It is that simple when you take this one verse. You know, when in Daniel we read about the ten horns and the eleventh comes up, means this eleventh horn comes up out of the ten existing horns. It comes out right. of the same community. In Second right. Thessalonians, um, the man of sin that is being revealed, the son of perdition, and when that falling away comes, it also comes out of the same community, comes out of the Antichrist. And that is something that people have to understand. Antichrist is someone who actually, in this case, the real Antichrist, the Pope, claims even to be Christ, but is Christ's friend openly. He is not an open foe. So many people are looking for an Antichrist who is an open foe to Christ, but that will never come. It is like Judas Iscariot, who was not an open foe to Jesus Christ, but was one of his disciples and betrayed him by a kiss. That exactly is what the Pope does. He betrays right. Christ by a kiss. He outs himself as being Christ's friend, where in uh -huh. truth he is Christ's enemy. But he comes out of the body of Christ, out of the quote-unquote church, the church yeah. that has been hijacked in 321, but out of that church the man of sin comes. So everybody 
out there on the internet who teaches the Antichrist is Islam, the Antichrist is Obama or Trump or whatever politician you want to fill in there. You once made the statement, Tom, they could even put up Mickey Mouse. Um, they don't care. But the point is, if he doesn't <coughs> come out of the body of Christ, out of the church originally, it cannot be Antichrist. That was the point that I wanted to make. And, of course, you, you can directly comment on that, but uh, you were quite right about the ten, ho uh, the ten horns, the ten nations Rome fell into. The Ostrogoths, the Vandals and the Hirulis were completely rooted out. There is no record left of them over. And the Vandals, who lived in northern Africa, and their um, capital city was Carthage, they were Aryans. And they had a specific view on how they viewed Jesus Christ. And in the very first church council, councils, the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Constantinople, uh, uh, the Council of Chalcedon, and the Council there in between, I don't remember where that was at the moment, uh, in all of these uh, councils, uh, the Vandals had another view of, uh, of, of Jesus Christ, because it was discussed there that he was even not begotten. Yeah? There was a whole discussion about in these uh, very first few uh, church councils, and the Vandals were Arians and had a other point of view of that, a more biblical point of view, and that's why they were among the Ostrogoths and the Rulis completely rooted out. Well, I would like to comment that uh, at least the first 75% of what you just said uh, sounds so much like the early Protestant teachers. This is what they discovered when they began to read the scriptures uh, in their own languages. Instead of being spoon-fed by the priest, they were able to read the scriptures for themselves. And they came to the precisely the same conclusion that you come to that the apostasy came out of the church and that the antichrist would come out of the church that he was no out or he was no outward opponent of christ he was a uh, an insider a betrayer like judas who would betray him with a kiss these you took this right out of uh, ancient protestant writings this is what the conclusion that was drawn after the uh, people began to read the scriptures for themselves. They came to the same conclusion. And you can read their writings and see how they came to those conclusions. And you articulated it perfectly. There was no, there was no dissent or argument with the Protestant belief. They were unanimous in their belief, just the way you stated it, in almost the exact same words that you stated it. And a true Protestant today states it the same way. But sadly, there are precious few Protestants left in the world. And uh, they would rather believe in a fictitious future Antichrist or a long dead and gone Caligula or, or, or Nero or even more ridiculously an Alexander the Great as the Antichrist or Antiochus Epiphanes or someone like that. It's absolutely insane. You can't come to those conclusions by reading the Scripture, and that's the trouble. They don't read the Scripture. They listen to the Roman Catholic priests, whose main objective is to exonerate the man of sin, the son of perdition, to make the world believe in him, to make the world believe that he's Christ's vicar. There's but one vicar of Christ. It's the one who Christ sent us when he went back into heaven. He sent us the Holy Spirit. He will teach you, guide us, and direct us into all truth. And uh, we know that if there is a vicar of Christ, it's, it's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. And so who is that man that calls himself the vicar of Christ, but a blasphemer of the Holy Spirit? These are the conclusions that were drawn by the Protestant reformers when they first in their lives had a chance to read the scriptures for themselves in their own language. And uh, uh, in addition to all the things you said, uh, their writings are still extant. We can, look th we can look them up and read them for ourselves. And clearly they were correct. And see, they understood the historical fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy, that it had already been fulfilled. 
in their lifetimes. All, all the way back to the, the fourth century when the papacy replaced the Caesars and when the pagan Roman Empire became the Holy Roman Empire. There was no change at all except the name. And there's nothing holy at all about the Holy Roman Empire. It yeah. is that great apostasy. It was given a new name, Tom. Isn't that what happens when you get baptized? Isn't that what happens well, when what... you get born again? That's, that's the way it is. The pagan empire, the pagan Roman empire, got born again by baptizing itself with Christianity and took on yeah. another name. Yeah. And that's what people just don't want to see. Yeah. You know, I'd like to make a comment, come to think of it. If I can, sure. I was just thinking along the lines of what you guys are saying, and and uh, you know, here where I grew up in Minneapolis, of course, uh, in a Lutheran church, we had this uh, born again kind of movement going on, you know, in our youth circles, and uh, you know, it was a kind of meme. Looking back on it, you know, that you just you just do the dance that everyone else does because it's popular, you know. It's popular to be born again, so I've got to be born again, so I'll just pretend that I'm born again, you know. And it's it's so fake. And, and you know, you really can't be born of the spirit till you are till you're reduced to nothing. Till you're completely desperate in your faith because really the 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 type of faith that uh that i had when i was young it was just not focused it was just and and then we have these churches with these pastors that are you know just giving us propaganda they don't give us the real scripture they give us propaganda and then we have this state that gives us propaganda, and we're just surrounded, we're flooded by lies, all to keep us from the scriptures and to keep us from the history. And, you know, the, the Bible is so incredible in terms of history. It just, looking at it now, just blows my mind. But before, you know, when I just, you know, it's so easy to get, caught up in what the pastor's telling you and completely miss what the Bible's trying to tell you. And uh, it's it's really uh, pretty dizzying, actually. Doctrination goes deep. It does. And it, it goes uh, wide, too. And uh, mm -hmm. I like what you said, you know, uh, for the new man to live, the old man has to die. And God is the one who brings us to the point where we're willing to let go of the old man. And that's traumatic. This flesh dies hard. The old man dies hard. And uh, you might call it tough love, but it's love nonetheless. The hard lesson to learn is uh, we give up our natural lives, and then we're born new of the Spirit. And, uh, the degree to which the new man can live the new life in Christ is the degree to which he crucifies the old man. And as hard a lesson as it is to learn, learn it we must. This, like we read even in the scripture, Sabbath day, meat for the belly and belly for meat, both, both will be destroyed in the end. The sentence has already been rendered to the natural man. Uh, 
all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The death sentence for sin is going to be carried out. And uh, the sooner we relinquish our hold on this fleshly life, the sooner we can live anew in the spirit. And uh, I could, you know, bore you all to death with, bore you all to death how God brought me to the end of myself. But I'd rather talk about my new life. And uh, I can only thank God for that. Back to you. Yeah, thank you, Tom. It it just appeared to me when I was reading Daniel 7 here, the verses 15 through 27, how important Second Thessalonians chapter 2 is. We already spoke in one of the earlier broadcasts about Second Thessalonians 2 verse 7. Because for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, and he only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. That was a very important part in our earlier reading of this book. And now with this Daniel... And when he speaks about the ten horns, and out of this ten horns the uh, the eleventh horn come, the uh, little horn comes, that reminded me of Second Thessalonians 2 verse 3. And that's why I just want to emphasize this a little bit on this broadcast and to uh, take it to the heart of the listener and the viewer of this video to get to the Bible and read Second Thessalonians chapter 2. The first twelve verses are all about the identification of the man of sin, the Antichrist. When you read this, and you understand this, you can not be deceived. Because it says in verse 3, Let no man deceive you. Here the Bible tells you the truth and warns you of the deception of men. He also lets us know, but through the context and the wording he used, that it will be a man that deceives. And who is that man? The man of sin in Rome. There's no other candidate. No other candidate. God made it absolutely child's play to, to, to determine from the scriptures who the Antichrist is through the prophecies and the history that fulfills them. There's, there's no alternative. If, if someone has an alternative that fulfills all these prophecies and all these scriptures, other than the papacy, I'd like to hear from them. But I don't think anybody's going to respond to that challenge. <laughs> no. I guess neither. But anyway, we are reading now Daniel chapter 7. First the verses 2 through 7 in the last broadcast, and now we repeat it, Daniel 7, 15 through 27. And on the end of page 33, the author continues and says, All seems in agreement. Yeah, like we here on the call. The four parts of the image and the four beasts picture the same four kingdoms, beginning with Babylon, then Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome. And again, dear listener, there is no fifth kingdom mentioned here. There is no kingdom of the Jews, as I said already in the last broadcast. The Jews only rule what Rome authorizes them to rule, and nothing else. If the story ended with the iron legs of the image and the terrible beast with the iron teeth from the sea, it would simplify matters considerably. However, it does not end there. The iron legs extend into two feet having ten toes, and those feet and toes are composed of iron mixed with clay. The iron legs represent the old pagan Rome, but the feet and toes of iron mixed with clay represent the old paganism which became mixed with papal Rome. For over one thousand years no king ruled in the European nations, nations which were an average of ten, who was not under the approval and control of the Pope of Rome. That is what Tom very often refers to as the Old World Order, when somebody wants to know what actually is the New World Order. It is nothing else but the Old World Order restored, but this time on a global scale. The 
old world order was the then known Western Hemisphere, the pagan and then papal Roman Empire, an average of 10 European nations. Today we have many more, but that's just because they like to split it all up. The point making is that in that time, for over 1000 years, as the author says here, no king ruled in the European nations who was not under the approval and control of the Pope of Rome, meaning there was no nation that had a ruler whose ruler was not approved by the Antichrist. And that's where we are heading now, but not only in Europe, in the old known Western Hemisphere, but in the whole world. And again, we come to a fulfillment of Bible prophecy, when it says that he reigns over the kings of the earth, the whole earth. Now the timing is clear, as the pagan Roman Empire fell, another power rose to take its place, which was ecclesiastical Rome, who ruled the ten individual nations that formed out of the European continent. This happened well after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, or even the fall of pagan Rome in 410 AD. So there you have, there you have the historical proof that preterism is a lie. Historical exclusion of preterism, I would call it. That's right. The historical disqualification of preterism. It's toast. Throw it in the trash bin and don't ever dig it back out. It's been proven a lie most handily. And we'll deal equally with futurism. Yeah, but the proponents of futurism will say, okay, Tom, you're right, because preterism we can dismiss because we can look into the past and can see that it's not being fulfilled. But can you see into the future, Tom? Yes, I can, de I can, de I can uh, destroy futurism just as handily as this author just destroyed preterism. It's Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. That's already been fulfilled. The record of it is the New Testament itself. There's no future 70th week of Daniel. There's no future Antichrist. There's no future covenant with the Jews that differs from the covenant that Jesus gave to all of us, the covenant in his blood. There's no dispensational exception for the Jews. I've, destroyed, I've just destroyed futurism just as handily as this author destroyed preterism. Well, Tom, when I ask you if you can look into the future, the simple answer is yes. You can look into the future. Brett can look into the future. I can look into the future. We all can look into the future because we have a look at the Bible. God knows the end from the beginning. God tells us how it's all going to end. When we read and study the Bible with understanding, we can look into the future because God told us what's going to happen. That's why we can make a faith-based choice. We have the choice whether to choose Christ or to choose Antichrist. Throughout the whole Old Testament, as or the Law and the Prophets, as I said already earlier, Jesus Christ is being revealed to us. And from the moment that his ministry was done and the 70th week was fulfilled, the Antichrist was revealed to us all through the New Testament, the new covenant that he made. And we just have to understand that Jesus Christ, when he himself gave John the vision on the island of Patmos, that he wrote down what is today known as the Apocalypse or the Book of Revelation, those are the words of Jesus Christ himself, who said, I will show you things who will shortly come to pass. When we read this with the understanding, then we can see into the future. And by that, we can dismiss futurism with the same certainty, with the same correctness,
and with the same basis as we can dismiss preterism. Now, in addition to that, I would add there's another way to look into the future that's just as just as likely to come true as anything. And that is if we understand that Jesus already fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago, and the Antichrist church teaches a future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, then we can look forward into the future of Rome's counterfeit fulfillment and what she must do to seemingly refulfill Daniel's 70th week all over again. And already we see the, the establishment of the modern nation state of Israel in 1948. This is not for the purpose of, of fulfilling any Bible prophecy. This is, this is the fulfillment of Rome's future fulfillment, the counterfeit fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. We know there must be Jews living in the land because they will be doing animal sacrifices. You can't cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease unless there are Jews living in the lands making animal sacrifices. In a rebuilt temple, we can predict fairly reliably the rebuilding of a temple in Jerusalem, preferably on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. And you, can, and, you, and you have to realize that there has to be, now that they, they say that the Antichrist will cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease, then you can pretty reliably uh, predict that Rome is going to come up with somebody who will sign a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews to get them to build their temple and begin animal sacrifices. And then in the midterm of that seven-year period of time, he will back out of the contract or the, the, the covenant and will cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. This is how Rome is going to convince the world of a different Antichrist than the Pope. Okay? Always, throughout its entire history, the Pope has tried to shed itself of the onus, the very, very stubborn onus that the papacy is the Antichrist. So the papacy has to put the onus on someone else. And that someone else is whoever Rome puts up to sign this seven-year peace treaty. And then once that treaty is broken, then the world will be convinced uh, that this man, whoever it is, is the Antichrist of the Bible. Never realizing that it was Jesus who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago. Daniel's prophecy was all about the Messiah. There's not one word of reference uh, in Daniel's entire prophecy that has anything whatsoever to do with the Antichrist. It's all about Jesus Christ. That was how God gave Daniel the vision of the coming of the Messiah, a precise date on the calendar. After, after 69 weeks, Messiah would come. And during the 70th and final week, in the midst of that week, he would cause the sacrifice and oblations to cease. The New Testament records Jesus' baptism by John in the River Jordan. Three and a half years later, he died on the cross for our sins. Messiah should be cut off, but not for himself. He, he was cut off for us. The, the New Testament is the perfect, detailed, historical record of Daniel's prophecy being fulfilled. And so if Rome says no, that wasn't the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, there has to be a future fulfillment of 70 of Daniel's 70th week, 2,000 years later or thereabouts, then we have to have a modern nation state of Israel. We have to have the Jews living in the land. We have to have a peace treaty, a seven-year covenant, allowing the animal sacrifices and oblations to continue and then after three and a half years to have them cease. Then the papacy has effectively shed the onus of Antichrist onto someone else and that leaves the door wide open for the papacy to become in the world, in the, in the so-called Christendom, the very Christ. That, that's how we can look into the future. 
when you know Bible prophecy has already been fulfilled in history and someone proposes a future, a, a future fulfillment, then you know it must mirror to a large degree the perfect fulfillment 2,000 years ago. And this is what all of Christendom is look, looking forward to, a future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. It's called futurism. That's what's being taught in all the churches. Never is it made reference to Jesus' fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago. If anyone walked into a church and suggested that Jesus perfectly and completely fulfilled that prophecy 2,000 years ago, you'd be kicked out on your fanny. You would not be welcome in the church. And they would seek you out to persecute you and isolate you and drum you out of quote-unquote Christendom. Well, that's exactly where I want to be, outside of quote-unquote Christendom. I want to be in the body of Christ. I want to be in the truth. I want to be in him. And that's where we all need to be. So if you want to see what's going to happen in the future, you've got to find out what Rome's got up her sleeve. And all you've got to do is look at Daniel chapter 9, because he's going to do as perfect a refulfillment of Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, as he can possibly accomplish. Only this time it'll be someone else will be the Antichrist, and then the Pope will be the Christ. Yeah, he will come in his own name, as Jesus told us. Yeah, just as he told us. I came in my Father's name, and you received me not. And if one comes after me who comes in his own name, him you will receive. And that's the point. Jesus prophesied 2,000 years ago the phony refulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. I'll tell you, Daniel's prophecy said that the temple would be destroyed and that it would remain desolate until the consummation. What's the consummation? The end of all things. Jesus' return. Right? Now, some people interpret that to be it was remain desolate until the end of the war, 70 A.D., and that it was. God never dwelt in that temple from, that, from the time his son was sacrificed. And even before that, the glory of God stood not over that temple. Jesus called it his, the temple of his father, didn't he? But there was no glory in it except for Christ. That's the only glory it saw. And uh, there'll be no glory standing over the temple in Jerusalem unless it's a man-made glory, unless they can somehow mimic the glory of God with some laser display over that temple. God no longer dwells in temples made with hands. The whole world is looking for a future counterfeit and it, I believe God is going to make a mockery of it. The Vatican isn't going to be able to re-fulfill re the 70th week of Daniel with such perfection that it can't be easily destroyed by the Scriptures. <clears throat> but we can already see which direction Rome, and with the cooperation of the kings of the earth over which he now rules, they together created for us the modern nation state of Israel, 1948. The whole Christian world believes it was an act of God. It was not an act of God. It was an act of the papacy and, the, and an act of the kings of the world that reign and rule under him. The Allenby, uh, uh, the General Allenby taking over of the Middle East from the Ottoman Empire was just the papacy's attempt to uh, fulfill that future 70th week of Daniel. I mean, we, we've all heard and read all the stories of the miraculous wars being fought by the Jews against their Muslim oppressors. Their, their God that defended them wasn't the God of heaven. It was the God of the United States and Great Britain. Once Protestant nations. It's unbelievable what they've been able to accomplish. There's no future fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. God doesn't need a do-over. He did it quite handily with Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. 
Daniel's prophecy is over. The 70th week of Daniel was over 2,000 years ago. To look for a future one is to absolutely admit complete and total deception. And the whole Christendom looks forward to this future fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. And anyone who dares challenge it puts his life at risk. Mm. I'd like to comment, speaking of Christendom, I was thinking about that video, Yerk, you sent from, uh, oh, was it Bill Still on uh, uh, Donald Trump in his Easter address? Yeah. To America and the world? His ecumenical <laughs> Tom, message, yeah, as I call it. Yeah. Tom, did you get a chance to look at that? No. No, yeah. I haven't seen it yet, but I have it in my email inbox. Yeah. I can just about predict what it says. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I mean, if, if if he values Easter, then I know who he's supporting. Yep. Yep. The president. I mean, they use. A, 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 they just on use. Easter, it's got to be Roman. Yeah, they're using the nation state of Israel for their own purpose. You know, it's uh, it's it amazing isn't how God's how. Purpose. No, it's not. <laughs> Absolutely not. But they claim it is. Yeah, they're God, right? Yeah. They're God in Rome the, with a little yep. G, right? Yep. Man, it's just absolutely shocking how much the world changes once you see the papacy is the Antichrist. All of a sudden, the world makes sense, eh? Yeah. All of a sudden, the scripture makes sense, too. The New Testament oh, makes sense. Yes. Yep, a lot got to read the whole Bible over before. again. Yep. Yep. Okay, I'm going to continue reading here on page 34. I'm going to back up a paragraph because of this long discussion that we just had, but it's imperative to do that to, for the understanding of the next few paragraphs. Now, the timing is clear, the author says, as the pagan Roman Empire, Empire fell, another power arose to take its place. Ecclesiastical Rome, who ruled the ten individual nations that formed out of the European continent. This happened well after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, or even the fall of pagan Rome in 410 AD. The vision given to Daniel in chapter 7, which we just read, tells the same story in a different form. This beast is not content to be an ordinary terrible beast, it had the same number and uh, of appendages, but they were horns, not toes. As verse 24 advises, quote, And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that should arise. Unquote. Obviously, to come out of the original kingdom, which is pagan Rome, it had to be subsequent in time to that old Roman Empire. What did emerge from the old Roman Empire, I ask of you? Papal Rome. It should be of great interest that the Apostle John saw this same dreadful beast with its ten horns. He wrote of it in Revelation chapters 12 and 13. In Revelation 12, verses 3 through 4, we read, quote, and there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold a great red, red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Unquote. And in Revelation 13, verse 1, we read, and I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. It is safe to assume that this beast is the same in both instances, but no doubt you have noted one difference. The dragon in chapter 12 of Revelation had seven crowns upon his heads, while the best beast in chapter 13 had the ten crowns upon his horns. 
Now in Revelation 17 verse 9 we read, And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Unquote. These two chapters clearly portray the difference in timing we are so interested in. Chapter 12 shows seven crowns, which stand for power, authority, or forms of government, upon his heads. The seven mountains upon which Rome was built. Chapter 13 moves the ten crowns to his horns, which stand for nations and kingdoms, into which pagan Rome was divided into at its fall. Obviously, the crowns of power and authority could not be placed on the thorns, uh, on the horns, which are nations, until the nations were formed. Now, this took place during the rise of papal Rome. As Dr. Henry Gretton Guinness so clearly observed, again a quote from his wonderful book, Romanism and the Reformation from the Standpoint of Prophecy, page 113, quote, Some writers asserted that the predictions pointed back to Nero, that uh, this did not take into account the obvious fact that the Antichrist power pr predicted was to succeed the fall of the Caesars and developed among the Gothic nations. Unquote. These brief remarks referring to Daniel chapters 2 and chapter 7 plus Revelation chapter 12 and 13 are for the purpose of calling attention to the timing of the prophecies, not to a theological discussion of them. And now comes a very important sentence. Listen closely. The historicists expect, expect those of Rome to propagate the Preterist theory. However, for Protestant Christians with a Bible in one hand and a history book in the other, to be taken in by this error is almost unbelievable. Why is this such an important sentence? Because the Antichrist system that we are living in, the Jesuits who are the master of education since they introduced Medici learning against learning, and the school system provide us with the Bible they want us to read, which is not the 1611 authorized King James Version, which is not a true Bible, and they provide us with history books that they write, not history wrote, and they falsify history. So when you are a quote-unquote Protestant Christian who just picks up the next Bible that's lying anywhere on some table, and just the next history book and compare these things and you will not see what we see through this reading here. That is because you have not checked your sources. Like the Bible says that you should also test every spirit. You should also test every book that you are reading, every Bible that you are reading, and especially every history book when you match it to the Bible. Now, is there any comments from my two co-hosts co here on what I just yeah, read. I, uh, I think the author said it plainly. I think he said it succinctly. I think if anyone was listening and comprehending what the author is writing here, the historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy is confirmed. It happened in history precisely the way Daniel prophesied it. Don't look for a future fulfillment of these prophecies if they've already been fulfilled. Because if you believe in a future fulfillment of this prophecy, which is already fulfilled, you're believing in a lie. So I'm just always repeating myself. Prophecy is just... History written aforetime. Yeah, in advance. To find the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, you have to look to history. And when history reveals the fulfillment of certain Bible prophecies, then for heaven's sakes, don't expect a future fulfillment or you'll be deceived. The, the, the thing of it is, Satan 
doesn't like the way Jesus fulfilled the prophecies. Satan wishes to overthrow Christ's throne. And in order to do it convincingly among quote-unquote Christendom, future events have to look very, very similar to historical events. And that's what we see happening in the world today. The creation of a modern nation state of Israel with Jews living in the land. And all this talk about building a temple in which God will never dwell and to perform sacrifices that will only be a stench in the, no in the nostrils of God the Father. He already has his blessed Son sacrificed for us, the sweet savor unto the Lord. There can be no purpose for the modern nation state of Israel but to deceive God's people and to cause the Jews, once again, to offer animal sacrifices in their perfect rejection of Jesus. Now, what we've read in, in these most recent quotations from Revelation chapter 12, verse 3 and 4, Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, Revelation 17, verse 9, these are all historical fulfillments of the rise of the Antichrist in the fifth century up until the present time and the Pope was the head of it the man of sin the son of perdition the little horn of Daniel the Antichrist the papacy <clears throat> so you can see the deception is deep and wide and it is deceiving the very elect of God. For 50 years of, of my life, it deceived me. And if it were not for the mercy of Almighty God, I'd still be in the middle of that deception. God brought me kicking and screaming out of this delusion. I so much love the idea of a future fulfillment of the book of, of, of Daniel's prophecy. And the rapture, being raptured out just in the nick of time so I wouldn't be persecuted by this Antichrist that they're proposing. It's all a lie. The Bible describes a resurrection at the last trump. There's only one last trump. There's That's no why rapture. it's the last trump. That's why it's the last trump. There, there's no secret rapture. There's no future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. Or we'd have to deny history. And that, I, that history so perfectly and positively identifies the Antichrist as the papacy, Rome simply has to refulfill all that history in a, in, in a manner that favors the papacy. And that's what we're seeing in modern nation, modern day events. That's what the new world order is. The old world order was ruled by the Pope. The new world order is ruled by the Pope too. And it means for the new world order to be, the old world order to be restored in the new world order, Protestantism has to be destroyed, utterly destroyed. As long as there remains a credible voice in this world preaching the historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy, showing the historical fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy and the prophecies of John in the book of Revelation and Paul's prophecy throughout the New Testament, Rome's in jeopardy of being denied the kingdom that it so desperately wants. The Bible says after the Babylonian Empire, after the Medo-Persian Empire, after the Grecian Ro Empire, and after the Roman Empire, the saints will be given the empire. The saints will be given the kingdom and the dominion. There is a sixth kingdom, but it's Christ's kingdom. 
and it will never end. And those who are in that kingdom are those who were not deceived by the Antichrist, the papacy. That's the only way to enter the kingdom, Tom. That's right. Because if you believe, you. because if you believe in a false Antichrist, you believe also in a false Christ. When you believe right. in a false Christ, the right Christ cannot save you. When the right Christ cannot save you, you won't be part of the first resurrection, but you will be part of the second resurrection. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we have come to the last uh, little part, the last chapter of part one of this book, The Origin of Futurism and Preterism, which is called Misunderstanding and Misapplication of Scripture. Not that we have been talking about misapplication of scripture in the last broadcast ho 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 yeah we have done so far but we will take a short break and when we come back from the break we will read about the misunderstanding and misapplication of scripture in the book the origin of futurism and preterism so until the next part i thank my contributors tom fress from inquisition update and brett norman to come and share the time here in this broadcast and we'll see you next time until then juggler 66 from hour of the truth signing off so god bless you and bye bye